Good morning um, to those of you here and also to those of you watching online and um, to our press conference on EU copyright reform with a view from some of the new authors. Um, we have with us today our Greens EFA MEP, um, Julia Reda, who's the European Parliament's rapporteur on copyright reform. And we also have with us uh, Cory Doctorow, Lexi Alexander and Neil Yamunsi. And I'll pass the floor straight away to Julia to start the press conference. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, as rapporteur for uh, the review of the 2001 copyright debate, uh, I have presented a report with uh, very concrete uh, proposals for how to make uh, the lives easier for people, for artists and for companies to exchange culture online on the internet. And uh, a lot of these proposals are about particular exceptions to copyright, how to harmonize them on a European level and how to get rid of uh, geo-blocking so that videos uh, are available in any country where people in the EU are accessing them. I think these uh, proposals are really uh, central to completing the digital single market. Um, the European Union is based on four freedoms, on uh, the freedom of movements of people, goods, uh, uh, services and, and capital, and that the same freedoms that we uh, um, give people offline also need to be applied online. Now, ever since I presented this report, there has been a very controversial de uh, debate in Brussels and beyond. And um, I, just recently, I've, I've been very happy to receive some support, for example, from European libraries who have come out with a London manifesto, which is uh, calling for an ambitious copyright reform and for more common laws uh, that would allow libraries, universities to operate online. Uh, also, uh, one of the reasons why I came up with this uh, event that we have today is that uh, French YouTube artists have gotten together and uh, uh, created a video asking for copyright reform and uh also, some scientific studies recently by uh, Deutsches Institut für Wirtschaftsforschung have shown that uh, a strict copyright protection system does not actually lead to more creation, and that uh, sometimes having flexibility in a copyright system is actually beneficial not just for users, but also uh, uh, for uh, increasing the creation and cultural diversity. Now, in this debate, I think uh, there have also been a lot of uh, fears that have been voiced about uh, basically copyright reform in general. So while uh, a lot of my proposals are very specific, a lot of um, uh, the criticism of it has been rather about whether or not we should reform copyright at all. And um, the arguments against it have been very much about unknown consequences, that if we touch a system, we don't know what the negative uh, consequences might be. So uh, I have brought together this event, Meet the New Authors, um, to show what great creative potential we already have in Europe of people who are using the internet in a positive way um, to, to uh, bring their, get their culture out there, but also to make a living uh, of creative works with the internet rather than against the internet. And I think uh, that in the copyright debate and when we're talking about copyright reform, we need to focus more on how we can improve the situation of these creators who uh, want to be innovative, who are being innovative, and who are finding uh, new ways uh, uh, of dealing with culture and also finding new business models. So uh, here we have an, a new generation of artists uh, who are um, from, from different um uh, area. So within uh, the event that we're going to have today, we have photographers. Uh, we, we also have on the panel here uh, with Lexi Alexander, uh, uh, film director uh, who is working in Hollywood. We have uh, Cory Doctorow, uh, a uh, science fiction author who has been on a New York Times bestseller list several times. And with uh, Neil Jomunzi, we have not just an author, but also a European publisher um, who is using the internet as, as the means for publishing. So I'm uh, really glad that uh, with the Meet the New Authors event, we can uh, hear the success stories of people who are actually doing better with the internet than without, but also to discuss what we can improve about the copyright system uh, that is in the benefit of uh, artists and of uh, the public alike, and how we can uh, nurture the generally, I think, positive relationship that exists between uh, artists and their their audiences. So uh, with this, I would like to hand over uh, to Cory Doctorow. So I think that it's important. Whoops. Beg your pardon. 
Uh, my apologies in advance to non-native English speakers. I am one of nature's fast talkers, but I'll try to be slow. I think it's important to recognize that copyright is a technological regulation. It regulates activities that are intrinsically uh, technological, and as technology changes, the people whom copyrights benefits and the people whom copyright serves will change too, as well the contours of the law. It's pretty clear that at each turn in technology since the printing press, different groups of authors have been benefited by different technological uh, different technological turns of affairs. And um, the important thing about a copyright system, to my mind, is not ensuring that a specific author or kind of author is compensated, but rather that whoever is making money uh, from the arts, whoever is doing something that is making money in the arts, that um, those people just get the lion's share of the money, that the money is not uh, siphoned off by investors, by um, uh, platforms, uh, by third parties, that creators are first in line to get money from the, uh, gener from the income generated by their creativity. And what we have in today's copyright is a system that does just as much as it can to keep creators away from the money that their creations generate. So for example, um, we have uh, a system that says that uh, if you allow Amazon to put a digital lock on your book, uh, that only Amazon can unlock your book. And so if you later have a dispute with Amazon and you don't like the terms on which they sell your books, you have to hope that your readers are willing to buy your books again from a new platform because you can't authorize your readers to unlock your books from Amazon's platform. This is not uh, copyright serving artists in any uh, colorable way. Uh, likewise, we have problems with uh, the uh, increasing liability and compliance regime that we impose on the intermediaries, uh, Google, PayPal, Kickstarter, and so on. In the name of copyright, we're making it harder and harder to be one of those companies. So uh, they have to set up uh, copyright takedown systems. They have to do more and more uh, work to ensure that the funds that they remit are not going to people who infringe copyright, which which, causes, which requires them to make judgments about what does and doesn't infringe copyright, something that they're often not very well poised to do. And what that has done is reduce the number of firms that are available to serve as intermediaries for our work so that there are fewer and fewer of them in the field rather than more and more. There was a time when there were lots of companies that competed with YouTube. Now there are virtually none. Uh, what that means is that these independent companies that are independent of the entertainment industry no longer serve as the competitor of last resort, where if we don't get a deal we like from the big five studios or the big four record labels or the big five publishers, we can go and try to make it on our own by publishing our work independently and using the internet to distribute and collect funds for it. Instead, as the number of entities available for us to uh, build a publisher out of from uh, available parts has declined, the deal that we get from those companies has also gotten worse. So YouTube recently started its own Pandora competitor. It brought the four major record labels into a room to negotiate the terms for its music streaming. Having done the deal, it summoned all the independent artists and independent labels and said, we have determined the terms on which your music will be available in our service. And if you don't like it, you're not allowed to use YouTube anymore. And nobody can start a YouTube competitor anymore because while you can start YouTube with three guys, a pile of hard drives, and a garage in Northern California, you can't do it if you also have to spend 300 million euros on content ID to comply with copyright rules. And so there are no new YouTubes except YouTubes that are started by companies that are as big as Google and that are in no way competing for our money. The worst thing of all is that none of this is actually putting money in the pockets of copyright creators and that none of this is actually reducing piracy. We are paying terrible penalties uh, in terms of the infrastructure of the internet in the name of preserving artists' incomes and doing very little to preserve artists' incomes. We have imposed a system of unaccountable censorship and surveillance on the internet in the name of defending copyright. And um, we have done so without receiving tangible benefits to copyright. If there's one thing I know as a creator and have known since I began my career in the arts, it's that the arts should always be opposed to surveillance and censorship. And when copyright and surveillance converge, artists should know that there's something wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I head over to Lexi Alexander. 
Hi, my name is Lexi Alexander. I'm a filmmaker. I'm originally from Germany, but have been living in the United States, actually Hollywood, exactly in the midst of it for the last 20 years. I've made um, five movies. I work in TV and commercials. Um, I've come to uh, the copyright issue actually by way of fighting in Hollywood for diversity and gender equality. At some point, somebody mentioned to me that um, the organization who is really in charge of Hollywood um, doesn't have money or any resources to, uh, to promote gender equality or diversity. So I decided to do some research um, in who has who has the money and why don't they have money? And I, I have come across this, uh, this truth about where, where foreign levies go and what foreign levies are and how collection societies function. And um, it made me more upset than the, the issues I originally <laughs> was an activist for. Um, and I am here to support the reader support, although I have to say the reader uh, report, although I have to say it doesn't go far enough for me. There's actually, I would, would want it to be much more aggressive, and I think it's uh, much too soft here to say that. Uh, but I am at the very least here to say this. There's many people opposing this report who say that they represent me or people like me. And this is a myth I would, I would just like to uh, expose as not true. Um, and I, I have come prepared with foreign levies checks and uh, to show you the way of how these monies actually get distributed. Um, because I have several films where I've now followed this money and also followed the experience, I can show on the one hand, um, you know, when the people who post this report say they're doing it for poor artists like me, and yet they get 92.5% of everything the collection societies collect, I'm not really sure I want them speaking for me. And then on the other hand, I have one movie um, that was very, very popular in America, but for some reason wasn't picked up from any other country. Now, given that I am originally from Germany, I went home with my own DVD of it and had a screening, like a public viewing in the town I was born. Um, and it was hugely successful, and then for the next year I had 500 people on Facebook asking me, when is this movie coming? When, is, when can we get the soundtrack? The movie wasn't adapted in, in foreign countries, wasn't uh, uh, bought, not because it was bad, but it had a singer and a rapper, and apparently for some countries it seemed too hard to synchronize with a singer and a rapper. When I suggested, um, why don't we just do subtitles, uh, I was told nobody watches movies with subtitles. I find that hard to believe. Um, I think the younger generation is much more global than the people making decisions. But so now I have an ultra popular movie in America that I can't even, because of the deal I have with the, the only distributor that I have a deal with in America, he won't allow me to um, distribute this film online for any other country to see for free because even though he couldn't manage to sell this movie, he also won't allow me to show it for free. Mind you, this is a movie I have written and directed that I have yet to see a single dollar of profit on. So all I'm here to do is really to say, I think we should be very careful, at least in my case or in Hollywood's case, who speaks for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the final presentation is from Neil Jouminsi. Bonjour, alors je vais m'exprimer en français. Euh, en tant que français, auteur et éditeur, hein, avec cette euh, triple casquette, hein, euh, je suis forcément face à ces problèmes de droit d'auteur et de droit d'éditeur. Euh, J'ai commencé ma carrière en vendant des livres, J'ai été euh, libraire pendant plusieurs années avant de fonder ma maison d'édition entièrement numérique, c'est-à-dire que nous ne publions que des ouvrages au format numérique, euh, tout en continuant ma carrière d'auteur en parallèle. Et s'il si, euh, y a vraiment une chose que j'ai appris en travaillant dans le numérique et en travaillant dans un contexte français, c'est que on ne peut vraiment avoir aucune certitude en matière de droit d'auteur à l'aune des problèmes qui nous font face aujourd'hui. Euh, il faut euh, 
impérativement remettre les choses dans le contexte et en particulier euh, dans le contexte de la France, euh, les attaques euh, les plus virulentes euh, portées contre le rapport Dreda euh, viennent de France et euh, quelque part ça me met dans une position assez inconfortable parce que euh, je suis plutôt d'accord avec elle alors que 99% des gens qui représentent l'art et en particulier mon domaine, l'édition et le livre euh, dans mon pays sont contre et euh, et ça me met dans une position assez inconfortable parce que c'est une manière euh, de faire peur et d'occulter les véritables problèmes. Euh, pour moi, c'est véritablement un problème de peur. Euh, les auteurs ont peur, les éditeurs ont peur, peur de beaucoup de choses. Ils ont peur de voir la diversité culturelle euh, bafouée, Ils ont peur, les auteurs ont peur de voir leurs revenus divisés. Euh, toute cette révolution numérique fait peur à beaucoup de gens et... Encore une fois, cette, euh, cette conclusion à laquelle je suis venu, c'est qu'on ne décide de rien de bon dans la peur hein, et que cette révolution, moi, en tant qu'auteur, je, je suis vraiment très excité à l'idée de vivre à cette époque. J'aurais voulu naître à aucune autre époque parce que nous avons les moyens et les leviers de créer autre chose pour la première fois depuis peut-être l'invention de, de la presse à imprimer de Gutenberg. Et... Il faut impérativement qu'on saisisse cette opportunité, l'immense opportunité qu'est Internet et qu'est la libre diffusion des arts pour euh, créer un nouveau modèle qui soit bénéfique aux auteurs. Puisqu'aujourd'hui, les auteurs sont les premiers à, à combattre un changement euh, du droit d'auteur, alors que c'est un modèle dont ils ne bénéficient pas et dont ils ne bénéficient plus depuis très longtemps, euh, pour de basses raisons contractuelles, puisque aujourd'hui le droit d'auteur est davantage un droit des éditeurs à publier des œuvres qu'un droit véritablement des auteurs à, à vivre de leurs œuvres. Donc, dans ce contexte, je pense qu'on doit, on ne peut pas faire l'économie de euh, d'étudier toutes les possibilités qui s'offrent à nous. Et Internet est évidemment l'une des possibilités, et on ne devrait véritablement pas se fermer euh, cette voie. Thank you very much. Um, the floor is open for your questions. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Eccles. I'm with Europolitics. Um, I've got a question for MEP Raider. Um, you talked a little bit about the reaction to, to your report um, outside of Parliament. I just wanted to know what kind of response you've had uh, from your fellow MEPs and if you've had Um, any particular support from political groups or not? Uh, what I've uh, noticed from the reactions from MEPs and also from the amendments that have been tabled is that the opinions are really um, uh, decided by particular uh, individuals and not by political groups. So, for example, if you take the liberal groups, I have uh, received, uh, I've, in my opinion, very valuable amendments, for example, from uh, members uh, Marietje Schake or Cecilia Wikström, who are, uh, I, I think, going more in uh, the area uh, of uh, additions to the report, for example, highlighting the problems that uh, the InfoSoc Directive has created for cultural heritage institutions that that uh, I think is, is very important if we want to preserve our cultural heritage. And at the same time, uh, uh, the shadow rapporteur from uh, the Liberals, Mr. Kavada, has been quite opposed to any kind of copyright reform. And I'm actually seeing this with a lot of uh, the political groups, that there is a diversity of opinions within the group and that uh, a lot of the groups are really still at an early stage uh, when it comes to uh, finding a position. So I think um, it has really been a good decision to do this uh, initiative report at this early stage so uh, that the discussion about copyright reform is starting now and not just uh, at the moment when the Commission actually comes forward with a proposal because I think uh, a lot of the opinions also within the European Parliament are, are still uh, at an early stage. The debate is at an early stage. And a lot of the problems that we're facing today are extremely technical. So take, for example, uh, the question of the research and education exception, where uh, the Commission has said they're going to uh, change it within their copyright reform. Um, one uh, um, 
uh, issue that uh, a lot of that has received a lot of debate is the question of whether uh, the exception for research and education should be limited to non-commercial uses. Uh, if you're hearing about this issue for the first time, you might think that this is a very good idea because you want really uh, you want to facilitate learning and you don't want to generate new income sources for companies. But uh, when you are dealing with the issue, when you're talking to universities, uh, you find out that almost no university in Europe actually qualifies as non-commercial anymore because they are receiving third-party funding, because uh, they are actually encouraged to do partnerships with SMEs. I mean, in the Horizon 2020 program, the Commission is actu actively encouraging these collaborations. So basically, things that were possible under copyright law in the past are no longer possible today because the situation of the university has changed. So these kind of discussions really need to be done in a great level of detail. They need uh, the, the weighing in of academic experts. And uh, so I think that the, the opinions within the European Parliament are also so, still shifting because of that, because uh, uh, copyright is uh, a complex topic and you really do need to invest time and a lot of discussion into it. Are there other questions? Yes, please. Hello, Maria Maggiore from Europal TV and the Italian Radio, Radio Popolar. I have two questions, one for Mrs. Reda. If I well understood, there are a lot of amendments who have been presented, one, 500, more than 500. If they will arrive to change the nature of this report, will you withdraw your signature or you will still go until the end? First question. And the second question is for Madame, Lady, I don't remember your name, sorry. Um, but it's more a question for you, creators and artists. I also make documentaries, so I know how difficult it is to produce a uh, film and, and to develop it. Um, if you eliminate this part of, of money coming from the distribution, then uh, where do you f will find the money, in fact? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do intend uh, to, to see the report to its successful conclusion. I mean, at the moment we are discussing and negotiating compromise amendments, and it does look like uh, we do, uh, we will end up with a compromise. I mean, um, uh, in one of the, well, in, in out of the three opinion committees that have voted on their opinions so far, uh, two of them have managed to adopt an opinion, and both of these opinions from the IMCO and ITRA committee, I think, uh, include a lot of very encouraging uh, signs and I think m sometimes uh, the fears from a lot of the people I'm talking with uh, seem to be more about the fact that I'm a member of the Pirate Party and not so much about the actual contents of the report. So if I'm looking at the two opinions that have been adopted, I'm actually quite encouraged that we can end up with a report that has sensible conclusions. Like for example, the ITRA opinion is calling for a reduction of copyright terms and is also highlighting the need for an an updated education and research exception, and the IMCO opinion is very critical of geo-blocking, so I think there are a lot of good elements. But at the same time, there is also a risk. Uh, what we saw in the Culture Committee was basically that uh, members were not able to come to, uh, to a conclusion, but this didn't mean that a bad report or opinion was adopted, but simply that there was no opinion. And of course, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, possibility and this risk exists, so I think uh, we, we in the European Parliament and in the Jury Committee really need to work hard to come to this compromise that can uh, find a majority, and I consider it my job uh, to take care of that. Hi, fellow filmmaker. <laughs> Um, it, that is a, it's a very complicated uh, question because there's several different aspects to it. Uh, for one, um, you know, part of what I do is um, I'm in, in the movies that sometimes have a lot of explosions and are considered action movies and cost a lot of money. And you can't crowdfund these kind of movies. Um, TV won't make 30, 40 million dollar movies. Um, and people, maybe it's oftentimes in Europe, I come across people who say, well, maybe we don't need these movies. And, you know, in a way, maybe we need a few less superhero movies, yes, but I don't know, I wouldn't want to miss a movie like Avatar that James Cameron did. I thought that was 
was a beautiful movie. I think there's actually beautiful movies in, in that genre as well. And in any case, because um, you know, I also have friends who work in uh, the movie industry as crew members. Um, sometimes people say, why is it always costing so much money? Well, because you know, schlepping cables and, and, and camera trucks and uh, the guy who has to be there at 4 o'clock in the morning in the freezing cold to put up C-stands, that's not as glamorous as what you know about the movie industry. It's, we're not all um, actresses and actors and directors who come and get our coffee brought. There's, there's an industry of very, very hardworking people, and we do have to take care of them. And so it's much more like um, when the Rolling Stones have a concert, like who is the person who builds the entire stage, and do we not want to pay them? And because a movie is something that's like a Rolling Stones concert for 30 days, 30 days a new stage is built, and equipment and light is made, so you have to pay these people. That's why movies are expensive. And you're absolutely right. Who gives us the money? Um, you know, I would say the reason you don't have Steven Spielberg sitting here or anybody uh, of the A-list directors that you recognize is because it's a very smooth system. Many of them don't speak about this. They may agree with me, but not, uh, not uh, many are crazy enough to actually say it out loud. Um, uh, you know, we don't want to say that there's something wrong because we fear that nobody will give us money anymore to make these movies. And that's a very, very solid fear. It's a true fear. Like, you do get blacklisted for, you know, basically, you know, they, they call it biting the hand that feeds you. Now, that's Hollywood. There's other systems, especially in Europe, which I've now looked into. I've um, focused on Germany, where a lot of it is government funded. And I thought, surely, that that would be more democratic and it would be decisions based less on who is famous. And I've come to find out that in no country that has great government funding uh, for uh, documentaries, um, movies, uh, TV, uh, does it ever go outside to anybody who's already established or comes from some kind of family that's already in the business. Um, it completely ignores working class people. Like if you're born in a town in a working class family, there's no chance you ever even get in one of those film schools that qualifies you to get any of these fundings. Um, it completely ignores any immigrant in any of these countries. Um, you know, very, I mean, what we have one in Germany who's made a movie, but we, we don't ask, you know, we, we don't check who is actually a storyteller of the people who come from, you know, uh, less fortunate countries, but that have now made a great living. Now, if you ask me, I always say to people, you have five people at a dinner party at your house. Who want to tell who who do you want to talk most? The person who's had a comfortable life and basically the same life as you, or maybe the kid who came from Syria or from Albania or you know, who had this story of like overcoming. But we don't let them tell stories. So what I can tell you is this. None of this has anything to do with copyright because the distribution money does not decide who else gets funded for movies. So that logic is completely incorrect. Like if we change, if we reform copyright, that doesn't mean people suddenly don't get money for films. Um, I think we have to work on who gets money for films, but I'm pr I promise you, I put my hand in the fire that copyright reform will not prevent funding. It it's literally has nothing to do with each other. That's not the money where they get their money from. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I wanted to answer that briefly as well, to say that um, as someone who sells his works within the European market in lots of languages, that really territory for most of us is just a, a proxy for language. That um, selling the English rights to the Netherlands is effectively a non-existent proposition. Right? We sell English rights, we sell French rights, we sell German rights. Sometimes, in very rare cases, um, you may sell the Italian rights in Switzerland first and then get picked up by an Italian publisher, but that's usually if you're Swiss Italian and you find a little publisher who does extraordinarily well. The people who benefit from having market segmentation in the EU are a small number of, of entertainment companies, mostly in sports and a little bit in music, for whom linguistic barriers are not as important as national borders. And they may uh, have some impact to their bottom line, but what's the benefit? Well, the benefit is 
that I, as a European author, don't need to do independent deals with 25 countries to make sure my works are available. And right now, the platforms are so messed up by trying to manage territorial rights that it's almost impossible. Um, my goddaughter's father lives in Torino. And the last time we went, I, uh, or my daughter's godfather, rather, the other way around. The last time I brought my daughter to Torino to read to her, uh, to, to see her godfather, I went to read to her at bedtime, and I went to download an English book. And I wasn't allowed to download the English book because I was presently in Italy, and the platform was smart enough to figure that out and scared enough of violating some territorial right that because it couldn't resolve the ambiguity in the way the territories were expressed in their metadata, it just refused to take my money. Now, as a father, that's frustrating. As an author, it's terrifying. Because the last thing I want to know is that in countries across the continent that I am a citizen of, people who want to give me their money are being told that they're not allowed to because copyright. If there's anything more insane and backwards that I can imagine, I don't know what it is. Right? Streamlining that will benefit the vast majority of audiences and the vast majority of creators. It is not an existential risk to my books or your documentaries to know that people who speak Italian who happen to be vacationing in um, uh, Bulgaria can watch it this weekend. Uh, and it's not an existential risk to people who make incredibly valuable uh, five-figure AAA movies to know that some of their territorial income will be, re re will be reduced by an infinitesimal fraction of a percent because they can't do separate deals in different territories. Um, what this is is revenue maximization for the rich uh, at the expense of everybody else whose works suffer as a consequence. Thank you very much. We don't have any more time because we're going straight to a conference with the participants here and, and some others. You're welcome to join there. Um, it'll also be streamed live and you can find the link on our website, greens-efa.eu. Um, thank you all for joining us and thanks for those of you who watched online as well.